Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, uh, Emily, for that very warm welcome. And uh, let me first say how delighted I am to be at the uh, Clinton School of Public Service. And uh, when you mentioned the fact that I had been ambassador to the Philippines, I was appointed ambassador to the Philippines by President Clinton. And when we were serving out there, we had the honor of uh, receiving uh, President Clinton and Mrs. Clinton on a state visit to the Philippines. And I was telling the stor story earlier. The protocol people from the White House had told me, under no circumstances will you allow the president to play his saxophone. <laughs> because they just didn't like all these pictures of him traveling around the world and always the only picture that got on the front pages was Bill Clinton playing his saxophone. So I did my very best. But it turned out that uh, the president of the country of the Philippines at the time was Fidel V. Ramos and Mr. Ramos's wife, Ming Ramos, was a piano player. And she had a very good group, a combo, and they were the featured uh, entertainment at lunchtime. And of course, uh, no matter what strictures or prohibitions that I could talk about to everybody in the Philippine uh, protocol setup, Mrs. Ramos was sitting right next to Mr. Clinton at lunch. So guess what happened? And. Uh, Will you please play the saxophone? Of course I'll play the saxophone. Well, where's my mouthpiece? Well, there is no mouthpiece, and so on and so forth. But he ended up doing a wonderful re rendition of Summertime, and yes, the papers had his picture on the front page playing the saxophone the next day, and I thought that was just fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've had the privilege of working for a lot of presidents. Anybody who's been in the Foreign Service of the United States of America or at least many of us, uh, get that opportunity at one point or another in uh, our uh, careers and in our lifetimes. Because I've been an ambassador uh, five times, and because I was fortunate enough that presidents, uh, whoever was in office at that particular time, visited my posts, I had a presidential visit to Honduras, I had a presidential visit to Mexico and to the Philippines, which I just mentioned. I also had a chance during the course of my career to work directly for presidents. I was the deputy national security advisor under Colin Powell in the last year of the Reagan administration. So I got to brief President Reagan uh, every day at 9.30 in the morning for half an hour on uh, national security uh, matters. Uh, I uh, uh, was President uh, Bush Sr.'s, Bush 41's, ambassador to Mexico, and he uh, had a direct hand in selecting me for that position, and I was able to interact with him quite closely uh, in the course of those responsibilities. And of course, as was earlier mentioned, I worked very closely with President Bush, 43, W, uh, during uh, his entire presidency, uh, not only as ambassador to the United Nations, but also as ambassador to Iraq uh, and uh, the first director of national intelligence and then as deputy uh, secretary of state. So I've had a chance to see a sampling, I mean not a full sampling, but a sampling of what uh, presidents uh, are like. And it's really very interesting because you might ask yourself, well, okay, so what, what is the common strand? What's different? How different are one, is one president from the other? Do you really get all different types of personalities and behaviors? And I guess the first thing I would say is that I don't think I've ever met a president who I didn't feel uh, took his position with the utmost seriousness and dedication. And believe me, it is a truly, I mean, a full-time uh, job in, in the definition of the word, word that I don't think any of us can really uh, appreciate. It is just a total commitment, I guess is the right word, is required of anybody who's carrying out that position. 
I think the second is just perseverance and uh, persistence starting with the perseverance that's needed to win an electoral campaign. I mean, if you look at the, I mean, those are endurance contests of the first uh, order and, uh, and only somebody with that kind of endurance uh, can f ultimately reach the presidency. But then when you start talking about other attributes and characteristics, are presidents uh, charismatic? Are they intellectual? Um, what kind, are they people, persons? Well, I, I think you can think of different presidents and think of the different characteristics that they did have. I don't think anybody would think of Richard Nixon, for example, as a people person. Uh, I certainly didn't when he was president, and yet I thought he was rather cerebral. There was no question about it. He, uh, he took out that yellow legal pad and he made these meticulous notes at our meetings, and I sat in. Because I was the, uh, I worked for Henry Kissinger as the Vietnam person uh, on the National Security Council staff, and I went to the first summit that President Nixon had with Leonid Brezhnev in May of 1972, and I watched how Nixon behaved. And, and he really, I mean, talk about a guy who knew his foreign policy brief. Well, it was Richard Nixon. I mean, he obviously had other shortcomings that we all know about, which ultimately led uh, to his demise. But it was really uh, sort of a treat. It wasn't that much of a treat because I was taking frantic notes. I was told that we were obliged to produce practically a verbatim, verbatim transcript of the meeting after it was over and within several hours. But, but it was a treat to watch uh, this man perform. It was also very amusing to watch his Russian hosts. We were out at a dacha, uh, the villa of Chairman Brezhnev, with all of his top people. He had his prime minister, he had his foreign ministry, he had his national security advisor there. And the subject was Vietnam. We had a four-hour conversation about Vietnam. You can look it up in the, in the history books about, about that period. And frankly, uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of getting very repetitive as each of these Russian leaders went through their whole litany about Vietnam. You know, how much can you criticize us about Vietnam? Well, you know, four hours is an awfully long time. And I remember Mr. Nixon at one point whispering to Kissinger, he said, gee, we gotta get out of here. And uh, so finally we managed to end the meeting. And um, then the Russians, I think somewhat to Mr. Nixon's surprise, said, oh, but now we have to go upstairs for dinner. And by then it was about 11 o'clock at night and we went up for another two hour banquet, banquet in this dining room they had. And I, I recall distinctly the, uh, uh, what I think, what I consider was an effort by Mr. Nixon's Soviet hosts to get him drunk. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't think they really uh, succeeded. Other presidents have great charisma. I, I think clearly President Clinton. President Clinton had enormous charisma. So did uh, John uh, F. Uh, Kennedy. Some are more intellectual than they appear. Um, and uh, I, I would say Bush 43 is in that category. And one of the things that always amused me, uh, I got to see him half an hour every day because I was briefing him as the national intelligence director and giving him his, uh, his daily intelligence brief. And he and Karl Rove had a running contest as to who could read more books. They walked around with this list about what book they had read uh, that day or that week. And, and uh, it was pretty heavy duty stuff. It was about you know, the Algerian war uh, during the French period. It was, uh, it was all kinds of, uh, it was history. It was uh, about uh, different wars and, uh, that had taken place in the past. And I'd say he must have read two or three books a day and, uh, you know, I would tell that to my rather anti-Bush, uh, I have two twin brothers and who really uh, didn't like uh, W very much, and they'd say, well, he was just making up for lost time. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, he really, uh, he didn't like to go out at night and all sorts of stuff. just curl up in bed at nine o'clock at night and read a lot of books. So I, I thought that was kind of interesting. Different presidents have a different way of gathering information. 
Uh, and presidents also, there's a spectrum also about how hands off or how hands on they are in terms of the management of the country's business. There's a saying about the Chinese emperor in the old days that the Chinese emperor reigns but does not rule. And I would say that was kind of the characterization that you could give to uh, Ronald Reagan and the way he directed the presidency. He didn't get a daily intelligence brief, for example, from the intelligence community the way Bush 41 and Bush 43 did. In fact, what he did was he would have me and or General Powell and myself come in every morning, give him his national security brief, and in the course of giving him that brief, we would give him the folder with the daily intelligence brief in it. And we give it to him at 9.30 in the morning, and then he would give it back to us uh, before he uh, left uh, work in the evening, and he would flip through it during the course of the day. We would never have that much discussion about it. So he had his own way of absorbing information. I had a preconceived notion that he didn't read that much or he wasn't that much of a study until uh, one time we were preparing for a trip that he was going to, he was either going to Russia or Gorbachev was coming to the States. I forget which it was. But two things he did that really kind of impressed me. One was he had a luncheon for all the leading experts on the Soviet Union, 15 or 20 of them, you know, from uh, different think tanks, from the Library of Congress, and so on and so forth. And he sat there with those experts. I attended that luncheon because uh, General Powell was not around that day or something, and had a terrific roundtable discussion where he listened to what each one of them had to say about what he could expect in his meetings with uh, <coughs> Chairman Gorbachev. And the second thing I remember him doing in connection with that visit was that he read Perestroika. He read the Gorbachev's book, and I remember him coming in the following morning, and uh, we, were, we were talking about it and exchanging impressions about it. And, and the thing that I began to notice about President Reagan was that he basically he did his homework, literally. If you gave him some reading during one day, he said, okay, serious people have given me this to read. I'm going to, I have a responsibility to read it. He came in at nine sharp in the morning and he left for his apartment in the White House at five o'clock sharp in the evening. But overnight, he would read his overnight assignments and he'd come in the next morning. And sometimes he'd even say, gee, couldn't you give me a little less reading the next time? I mean, because he really did try to, he really did make that effort to absorb whatever it is we, so you get the full range of uh, behaviors, hands-on versus hands-off. Now, this, when it comes to wartime, and after all, let's face it, uh, it's almost an inescapable uh, feature of being a president of the United States, that you are ultimately going to be first and foremost a national security president. Presidents come in since time immemorial swearing that they're not going to be national security presidents. They're going to focus on the domestic agenda. But there's this place called the big bad world out there. And there's always something ghastly happening somewhere. And uh, as often as not, the United States is somehow implicated or involved. I mean, remember how Vietnam bedeviled Lyndon Johnson. I mean, he wanted to be a domestic president, and he has some huge domestic accomplishments to his credit. We, we remember them to this very day. I mean, we all talk about Medicare and so on and so forth, and civil rights. I mean, he was a great president from a domestic perspective, but we also know that he left office really heartbroken because he had been unable to really deal as he would have liked with uh, bringing the Vietnam uh, War to an end. And he was 
more and more as that war progressed, a sort of a hands-on president. You all, we've all heard the stories about LBJ meeting once a week and uh, even picking targets uh, for, for bombing of North Vietnam and so on and so forth. Uh, we didn't really have uh, any such significant conflict during the Reagan administration and, and, and fortunately during the Clinton administration for that matter. There was Bosnia and, and Kosovo, but it was not on the scale that has kind of affected our national psyche the way these larger uh, situations uh, uh, ha have done. Uh, but, but with George uh, Bush Jr., uh, George W. Bush, uh, what I noticed, and I think this is a characteristic of presidents who are wartime presidents, is that as these situations go on, they become more and more directly involved in the management uh, of these conflicts uh, because they, they come to the conclusion that, that generals uh, really, I mean, they've got their expertise and they've got uh, their judgments and their experience, which is all invaluable, but they've got to give it the political dimension uh, that is required. And uh, by the end of his term, I can remember uh, President uh, George W. Bush uh, basically having weekly, even sometimes daily, video teleconferences with our ambassadors and our commanders in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, and Pakistan uh, pretty much uh, leading the interagency effort vis-a-vis -vis, uh, those uh, situations. So you, again, you have this range of behaviors, although I think that the more serious a conflict situation gets, the more a president is going to be personally involved. I guess Franklin Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln would probably be the best examples of that. And remember the stories about Lincoln going down to the telegraph station every day to get the reports of what was happening on the front. But that kind of leads me, I know I'm probably going on too long here, but uh, leads me to current uh, foreign affairs and the current state of uh, American foreign policy. And I, and I won't uh, dwell on it long because uh, perhaps we can draw that out during the questions and answers and discussion. But, but let me just say, make a few key points. And, and the first one that I would make, and which I think is really important, is that the menu does not change. Just because the political actors in the United States have changed, just because we've had a change in administration, doesn't mean that the situation out there in the world has dramatically changed. I mean, there's still Iraq to deal with, there's still Afghanistan to deal with, there's still this question of the fact that Al-Qaeda uh, and terrorists are plotting to do harm to the United States or to United States interests and United States allies around the world. You still have an unresolved Arab-Israeli uh, peace uh, situation you still have uh, real challenges just south of the border here in Mexico where narco traffickers uh, and lawless elements have uh, uh, really uh, caused great disruption in, in that society. And, and a president, any president, has got to carry out strategies uh, to deal with those situations. What the change in administration does do is uh, it brings a fresh face. It brings, uh, I think, in the case of President Obama, has brought a lot of international goodwill. There's a lot of goodwill out there saying, well, we've got a president who seems to be more approachable, uh, a little more outreach to the rest of the world. He went and gave this terrific speech in, in Cairo where he was reaching out to the Muslim world. So it builds a certain amount of goodwill. Uh, towards the United States and a disposition that uh, hopefully will make it a little bit easier to resolve problems. But believe me, the problems remain. And uh, foreign policy problems don't, many of them don't get solved. They get managed. And they get managed over a period of time until you get some kind of a break that 
permits you to put that issue in a better place. But for a large preponderance of them, get managed. And so one of the issues I think that confronts Mr. Obama is, well, there are all these expectations out there, and then there's some people in some countries who are starting to say, well, look, you've been in office for 10 months. Why haven't some of these problems started to go away? And the fact of the matter is that it's very hard. It's just, it ain't that easy. But uh, I think he's pulled together a very good team. Uh, he's, uh, I think Hillary Clinton is a great choice uh, for Secretary of State. And I'm not just saying that because I'm here at the Clinton School. I think she's a, a terrifically experienced person. She's got the background of having been a first lady, been a senator. She's tough-minded, she's smart, and she's got the kind of energy and drive that I think is needed to be a Secretary of State. I think the president, being president of the United States, is the toughest job in our country, but being Secretary of State is not far behind. And I think she's uh, done doing a very, very uh, good job, and I think, uh, and, and, and uh, I know she'll, she'll keep at it. But uh, today, uh, just to pick one issue, we've got the question of uh, the commanding general uh, in Afghanistan having asked for additional uh, troops, uh, General McChrystal, to do the job in Afghanistan because he judges that there aren't sufficient troops out there. And to me, the whole issue of Afghanistan conjures up many of the experiences I have had in the past in my career because I was uh, in, in Vietnam for four years. I was in Central America for four years. I served in Iraq. And there are a couple of points I'd like to make here. First of all, when the United States gets engaged, I think getting engaged in situations like these is a very, very weighty decision indeed. And I think if there's a mistake that we do repeat, uh, or we have seemed to have had a tendency of repeating, is that when we get in, we sometimes get into these situations thinking that they are easier than they are and that they'll uh, take less time to deal with than they actually will take to deal with. And I think that was true in Vietnam. I think it was true in Iraq and, uh, and in Afghanistan as well. And the second point I would make, and this is a little bit related, because if you think something is easy, relatively easy, and it's not going to take that much time, then you don't spend that much time thinking about building up local capacity. But in fact, you really do. If you judge the situation correctly and you decide you're going to go in there and you have the correct perception of how long it's going to take, then you'll put forward also a plan to build local capacity, in other words, nation building, which was kind of a uh, dirty word at the beginning of the Bush administration, but I think in the second half, they finally came around to an understanding that if, you're going, if these policies are going to have any chance of succeeding, you've got to build local capacity. So my answer on the 40,000, and, and I, I must admit, I mean, I think the president has a tough decision before him, uh, but my answer would be yes, but. And the but is that it should be in the context of a well thought out plan to build Afghan uh, military, police, and civic capacity so that they can improve their ability to govern. Not all of the country, it's too huge. It's the size of Iraq, it's an enormous territory. It's, enor it's, a, it's the same population as Iraq, the same uh, 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 territorial extension, but at least to be able to control the major urban centers and put them on a footing where they can then, over time, eventually wrest control of the entire country from the Taliban. There is a lot at stake because if, if Afghanistan is not resolved, that has implications for security in Pakistan. And Pakistan is also under threat from the Taliban. And of course, as we all know, this is where the 9-11 attacks were planned in that, that border area between uh, Afghanistan uh, and, and Pakistan. So maybe with those initial comments, I mean, I'm sure you have lots of questions. Let me uh, open it up to questions and comments. Yes, ma'am. One second, if you just wait for a microphone so everyone can hear you. Here it comes. Yeah. Uh, could you
you please comment on um, what you think of the value or effectiveness of the United Nations? What do I think of the value or the effectiveness of the United Nations? Well, here's a subject on which I had, if I, I might say, uh, a little bit of a disagreement with my, my fellow uh, Republicans. Now, you know, maybe in life you stand, uh, you, you, where you, you stand where you sit. And since I was sitting at the United Nations and was our representative there for three years, um, I was uh, more of an advocate for the UN than others in the administration. And in part, maybe, because I had an opportunity to learn some of the things that the UN can really do for us, like peacekeeping operations. I mean, would you rather send Americans to Sierra Leone, as happened ultimately? I mean, when I became permanent representative to the UN, Sierra Leone was a basket case. The government controlled one little sort of several square blocks in the, down in the center of their capital. And we sent uh, 17,000 UN peacekeepers eventually. None of them were American. And they wrested control of the entire country. And now there's a relative peace that reigns in Sierra Leone. That was done, thank you very much, by uh, your and my and everybody else's United Nations. And we paid. We didn't send any of our combat forces there. And we paid uh, 25 cents on the dollar for the cost of the peacekeeping operation, right? We, uh, our assessment is 25%. Ditto in other peacekeeping operations. Liberia, where peace has been finally, uh, you know, relatively speaking, restored. So in peacekeeping, I think the UN is very important. The UN legislates. I mean, we forget that sometimes. But the Security Council passes resolutions. We negotiated 200 resolutions while I was there. Now, some of them are kind of just, you know, puffery. Say, take half of them, probably don't have much operational effect there to make some kind of a statement. But the other half, they're binding on all member states. If a, if a resolution is passed by the Security Council, they're binding. So, for example, when uh, uh, um, thinking up uh, financial penalties for penalties for uh, providing financial support to terrorists, for example, uh, we were able to pass resolutions that prohibited this kind of activity. And, and that was fairly useful to us in, in the war on terror. And lastly, I think you've got to think about the fact that for a lot of countries, the UN provides a certain legitimacy for what we do. In other words, it's worth the effort for us to try to persuade the United Nations to have the same view as us on a particular issue. Think back to the incredible effort that James A. Baker made in 1990 before we invaded Kuwait to oust Saddam Hussein's forces from there. He went and got a UN, a unanimous resolution from the United Nations that gave us cover it didn't mean that, we, that those countries were going to do the fighting. It didn't mean that they were necessarily going to make any material contribution to what was done out there. But it gave legitimacy. I mean, if you think of what happened in the Bush, pres, Bush 41, 43 presidency when we went into Iraq, I mean, what is really, what went wrong? Well, one of the things that went wrong, among others, I mean, there were quite a few things that went wrong, but one of them was, we did not get the sanction, the legitimacy that is provided by having United Nations support. So, you know, if the UN didn't exist, as you know, the old saying goes, we would probably have to invent it. So my, my suggestion is that we, we, we support it, and uh, I think it's money well spent, some, and uh, we should continue to do so. And I think that that's, the, that's certainly the policy of this administration. Sir. Bob, right there. Okay, you two questions. Yes, Mr. Secretary, could you provide an estimate of the number of Al Qaeda that you perceive is in Afghanistan today? Boy, the question was uh, could I provide an estimate of how many of the number of Al Qaeda that are in Afghanistan? I, I don't think I could. I mean, if you told me, if you asked me, um, you know, is it in the tens of thousands? I would say probably not. Is it in the 
the high hundreds or the low thousands, I'd say, well, well, maybe. But, you know, it took 17 or 19 people to carry out 9-11. Now, they, were, they had a lot of backup, but they didn't have 1,000 people backing them up. I mean, you can do this with a fairly small number of people. Where I think Al-Qaeda is, the two other points I'd make since we're talking about Al-Qaeda. I think they've suffered in Iraq. I think we've been, I think General McChrystal himself, who was the special operations commander in Iraq, was very effective in dealing with Al-Qaeda there. I think they're growing in North Africa and in the Maghreb, in the sub-Saharan Africa. They're making inroads there. I think that's the area of the world where they're making some serious encroachments in addition to in the Afghanistan, Pakistan area. Latif. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Latif Salim from Afghanistan. Um, <clears throat> I believe you know that last week uh, the Congress of the United States approved a bill, uh, almost one bill, one point several billion dollars, to buy off the Taliban senior members in Al Qaeda not to fight with the U.S. in Afghanistan and Pakistan. From your point of view, is it a realistic initiative to buy them off to stop fighting, or it is just something to uh, yeah. a quick fix, or what is that? I'd have to look at the exact language uh, of that bill. The debates we've had in the past, and I really haven't seen that legislation, so I'd be re really reluctant to, to make a detailed comment, but the debate we've had in the past, and in fact, I had that discussion with Mr. Karzai myself when I was Deputy Secretary of State a couple of years ago, and we were talking about should he was asking and he was saying, well, should I or should I not talk to the Taliban? And uh, taking uh, sort of the vocabulary from, from Iraq that we had used there, I said, well, Mr. President, I think you have to think about the Taliban maybe in, in two categories, the reconcilables and the irreconcilables. And are, are there people who are willing to lay down their weapons and reintegrate themselves into the existing constitutional system of, of Afghanistan. I think those people you should be willing to talk to. I think the people who are determined to prevent uh, your political system and who want to reinstate the Taliban system of governance that existed before we liberated Afghanistan, I think that would be a mistake. In Iraq, we used some of these stratagems to try to bring some of the, quote, reconcilables, if you will, back into the system. And uh, so some, some efforts were done in that regard by, by hiring some of these uh, Sunni insurgents to, uh, to become part of the pro-government effort. And I'd say it was, it, was, uh, it was successful up to a point. Thank you. Uh, it's obvious that Iran is playing for time, and uh, in my opinion, eventually we'll have the bomb. What, because Russia and China is not going to help us in that regard, so what is your thoughts of us being in Iraq? Will that eventually turn out to be a, a good thing? Well, first on Iran, uh, I agree with you that they're just playing for time. In fact, I agree with everything you said about uh, Iran. And I think that uh, it's not likely that they'll give up their nuclear program. And, that, um, and, the, and, and it's hard to get the Russians and the Chinese to help. Although, we were talking about legitimacy earlier. Ideally, you want the Russians and the Chinese on board if you're going to ratchet up the sanctions against Iran to put more pressure on them. But if if you at least have the Europeans on board, that too is a good thing. And I notice that the Europeans are not very happy with some of the answers we're getting from Iran at the moment, particularly President Sarkozy. So it might be that we, working with Western Europe, might be able to ratchet up the level of sanctions on Iran to make them think a little harder about their nuclear program. 
And uh, that might, even though it won't be in the form of another Security Council resolution, it might have some effect. I think this is one of the great dilemmas of our current foreign policy, is what to do about Iran. I think you're right. I think they, they're headed towards having a nuclear weapon. When I was Director of National Intelligence in May of 2005, we uh, issued a national intelligence estimate that said two things. First of all, that Iran was determined to acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, and secondly, uh, that we thought that uh, at the present rate of their work, that they were likely to have such uh, a weapon sometime between 2010, which is basically tomorrow, uh, and 2015. So that was the time frame. And I don't think there's been any I haven't seen anything that really changes that judgment. So we have this conundrum, which I would just leave at that. I mean, what, what will we do if and when uh, the Iranians have uh, a nuclear weapon? Uh, take matters into our own hands. Uh, I, the, the military solution to that problem is very problematic. It's, and and there, there may not be any military solution. So I would favor continuing the diplomatic track may be accompanied by greater sanctions. Good, was it good or not good? The other question about, about uh, being in Iraq, well, first of all, I think we're probably headed out of there, certainly in terms of our uh, troop presence. I mean, we have committed to withdrawing our combat troops, uh, all of our troops, by the end of 2011, uh, unless the Iraqi government for some reason asks us to stay longer and if in, and then and then unless and if they do that uh, provided we say yes we're prepared to stay longer but I think for planning purposes we have to think of us leaving there militarily at least by the end of 2011. I think we we shall have had a profound influence on the course of uh, political developments there uh, and I, I it's hard to imagine them reversing all the advances they've made in the establishment of, uh, of representative government in that country. But it's uh, still a fairly fragile situation in Iraq, and that's obviously another one of the issues that the president's got to watch very carefully. Right, right. right in the middle. Yep. <laughs> Give me this. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for being Hi. here. If in 2002, you had been in the Oval Office, and the President said, I'm thinking of invading Iraq, as you know, but that means billions of dollars and, and thousands of, of people in the military, and I'm looking for a plan B. And he looked to you and said, what is my alternative to a, to a military solution as, as a diplomat? I think plan what, B. What might you have offered? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I sort of said it at that time. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, let's be clear. No one knew about all the flaws in the, the information that we were operating under, particularly the question about whether or not there were WMD in Iraq. So uh, with hindsight, we've got, you know, 2020 vision there, and it makes things look a little bit different. But the one thing I would have advocated then and did, although I wasn't in the immediate, at, at that particular time, I was not sitting in on National Security Council meetings or anything like that, like I was later when I was Director of National Intelligence. But what I would have said is, give the inspections more time. I mean, we set up, and we worked very hard to negotiate that resolution, 1441. I, in fact, I was the point person for that. And we passed that, I guess, in November of 2002. But the invasion preparations were really already underway, and uh, there was almost no stopping. It was as if the clock, I mean, the clock was already running, and I think we could have given it more time because it, it, we went in in March, right, uh, of the next year, so that's December, January, February, March. it's only four months, and I don't think four months was enough time uh, to give the inspection process uh, time to do its thing because the longer they would have gone on, let's say we had found something bad, the greater the chance of getting buy-in from the other members of the Security Council. And let's, I mean, let's be honest, the Security Council have been pretty responsive on the question of Iraq in the previous years. We had sanctions against Iraq, we had uh, 
the oil for food program. We had a, we had a lot of things that that sort of kept uh, Iraq sort of very much on, under tight wraps, if you will. And so we weren't going to lose the attention of the Security Council. But I think once we deployed so many forces uh, or started moving them to the region, and with a the idea of fighting in the summer up, didn't appeal to a lot of people. So if you're going to fight, uh, you either had to do it then or wait a whole year, if you will. And I think that affected some of the thinking uh, in the whole process. Yeah. Based on your introductory remark, Mr. Secretary, and your experience in Honduras, could you share with us some of your thoughts on our neighbors to the south and some of the issues we face there? Absolutely. Thank you. The question was about some thoughts on our neighbors to the south and uh, our relations with that part of the world. Uh, I sp I, I, one of my jobs, as was mentioned earlier, is I, I teach part-time at Yale. And yesterday, last night I met with a group of uh, Latino students at Yale University. Um, and, and one of the questions very much on their mind was, well, you know, how much does the United States policy care about Latin America at the moment? And it's a little bit hard because since 9-11, I think there's been a sort of a distraction. And it was very, uh, very uh, graphically illustrated uh, back in 2001 by the fact that on the 5th or 6th of September 2001, the first state visitor to Washington under the Bush 43 administration was Vicente Fox of Mexico. It was the first White House sort of state dinner in his presidency. Six days later, you have 9-11, and it kind of changed the whole equation. And I remember the president commenting to me several times subsequently, you know, in subsequent years, saying, like when I went with him to uh, Canada one time for a three-way, we have this security and prosperity partnership between Canada, the US, and Mexico, and where the leaders meet once a year. And I was accompanying the president. And he said, you know, this is the kind of thing we would have been doing more of if it had not been for 9-11. 11. Now, having said that, the Bush administration negotiated the Central America Free Trade Agreement. We negotiated a free trade agreement with Panama, and we negotiated one with Colombia. Those two agreements, Colombia and Panama, are not yet uh, ratified by the Congress, and President Obama's been a bit cautious about that because of commitments to to the labor movement here in the United States and so forth. But I hope that eventually, just like President Clinton did, I mean, President Clinton became a huge advocate of the North American Free Trade Agreement and, and I think pushed it through the Congress with greater enthusiasm and energy than George Bush himself would have done and it was negotiated in, in George Bush Sr.'s presidency. So free trade, it seems to me, is a very important element of our relations. The second thing, of course, is the war in Colombia. And it kind of related to this free trade agreement because the Colombians have been through so much tragedy, difficulty, insecurity. They have such a effective president. I think it would be a terrible slap in the face for these uh, heroic people if for some reason ultimately that agreement was not approved. So I think it's important in that respect. One of the big questions on everybody's mind is, well, is there going to be any change with respect to our policy towards Cuba uh, in the new administration? And I, I think that's very much remains a function of domestic American politics, and particularly how the Cuban-American community feels about this issue, because they're very vocal about it, as you know, and particularly vocal in Florida and New Jersey. and, and I mean, Bob Menendez, the senator from New Jersey, is one of the most outspoken advocates or the, uh, opponents to any kind of loosening up of our relationship with Cuba. But I think the president, within the authorities that he has in the executive branch, is, is trying to loosen things up, increase dialogue, uh, open up opportunities, make travel by Cuban Americans to Cuba easier. And he's even proposed uh, that America be, American business be allowed to invest in telecommunications uh, in Cuba, which I think is a very clever idea, really, because if you can get more communications going in Cuba, that too might have a good effect in helping democratize the country. The last point I would make is that 
there's been an effort over the past decade or so to improve relations with Brazil. I don't think the United States gave much thought to Brazil in earlier years, but now that Brazil is coming is one of the, you know, up the, one of the rising powers, as they call them, uh, we are paying more attention, and I think that's right. I think it's as it should be, and uh, I think outreach, outreach to Brazil has been a very important development. We have time for one more in the green jacket. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, what ever made the United States believe that it could win a ground war in Afghanistan based on <laughs> history, and two, given what's at stake in Pakistan, what is India's current position on this whole mess? I guess the tough questions always come towards the end. <laughs> uh, on, on what made, I mean, when we went into Afghanistan, I think we went in with the idea of uh, basically knocking the Taliban out of uh, Kabul, and um, I'm not sure how much beyond that we'd really thought about it. We set up this international uh, security assistance force under the auspices, uh, now under the auspices of NATO. I, I come back to my, question, my, my point about local capacity. I think the best way to acquit ourselves in Afghanistan is to use whatever time and space that is gained by granting Mr. McChrystal, General McChrystal, his request to build local capacity so that this burden and this challenge, that, as you describe it, is not on our shoulders alone going forward. Share it. And if we can find Afghans who are willing to carry that burden and, and, and do that, let's help them do it so that uh, to prevent the Taliban. I mean, after all, the Taliban aren't 10 feet tall. And they're, actually, they're pretty darn unpopular in, in, in parts of, of Afghanistan. So we ought to try and build on that. They've got to improve government. You saw in the papers that the President Obama's very concerned about reports of corruption and so forth. There's a civilian political piece that goes along with this that's got to improve. On what India's position is, I mean, I, I think they watch these areas with, with concern. And they, anything that is going to radicalize Afghanistan and then Pakistan is of concern to them for two reasons. They don't want an antagonistic Pakistan, and a more radicalized Pakistan would be more antagonistic. And secondly, there's 180 or 200 million Muslims who live in India. Let's not forget that. And so far, those, uh, that population, I don't believe, has been that susceptible to radical influences but uh, they, they're, they're probably not immune to them. And if things go worse in the neighboring countries, that could have difficult internal implications for India. By the way, last point about India is that I think that's been another area of transformation in U.S. foreign policy. We have had a significant improvement in U.S.-India relationships over the last decade. Prime Minister of India is coming here, uh, I think, in end of November, early December, and I think that's a very important development. There's a growing Indian-American community in this country. There's a lot of uh, two-way flow of business. Uh, it's a great opportunity. South Asia generally, India and Pakistan, are, are uh, interesting commercial and trade and investment and business opportunities reciprocally between that part of the world and the United States. <laughs>